everyone. Welcome to Harvest Christian Center for our Good Friday observance tonight. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. If you're a guest with us tonight, we invite you to feel right at home. Tonight is going to be a night of reflection and uh, looking back on what Jesus did for us on the cross. So as a way of uh, just a little instruction tonight for you to help us, when the service is over tonight, we're going to ask that you leave in a very reflective manner and save fellowship for out in the parking lot. There are going to be some that are going to want to stay and pray a little while afterwards, and if you do, we invite you to do that. Uh, but we want you to feel welcome tonight. We're so glad that you're here. And in just a moment, we're going to begin our presentation of the Living Lord's Supper. We've been in the Easter season for a little while now in the midst of Holy Week, and there's been a lot of activities going on leading up to this night. And I just want to thank everyone for all the hard work and dedication that you've given to make this night happen tonight. And we dedicate it to the Lord, and I'm going to ask you to bow with me in prayer. We're going to open our time together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of gathering together in that most holy and precious name. God, in your name, we invite your presence to fill this place. Holy Spirit, begin doing your work in our lives right now. Lord, we believe that in this auditorium tonight, there are many that have claimed you as Lord, has received you as Savior. And God, we ask that you speak to us in a new and powerful way tonight in this presentation. We also believe tonight, Lord, there are some here that have not yet surrendered their life to you. We pray that during this presentation tonight, this reenactment of the Lord's Supper, when they can see what Jesus has done for them, they'll make that decision to receive you, to receive your forgiveness, and to begin a new life in you. We commit our time to you now in the wonderful and glorious name of Jesus. And everybody in the house said, Amen. Amen. And I would ask that you'd stand and we're going to sing together. Uh, lead me to the cross. And as we do that tonight, I ask that you worship. And if you have brought cameras in tonight, and you have a non-flash setting on that, please use that setting during the presentation tonight. We greatly appreciate it. Let's lift our spirits and our hands and worship the Lord tonight.
can read these on myself And I belong to you So leave me
46, Jesus instructs his disciples to prepare for the Passover, which is soon to take place. They did as they were instructed. And verses 20 and 21 says, When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. And now that as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. In this instant, his disciples were shaken and disturbed by this news from Jesus. Their minds raced with confused thoughts as they each began to ask Jesus, Lord, is it I? They couldn't believe that they had heard him say, one of them, the ones dining with him, would betray him. Listen as we share some of the thoughts of the disciples about what Jesus has just said to them. I am Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. I was the first to bring someone to the Lord when I brought my brother Peter to Jesus. I also found the little lad with the five loaves and the two fish that day when Jesus fed the 5,000. I watched him feed so many with so little. I was glad in my heart when I decided to serve the Lord by just being myself. I must have seen something of value in me that others had overlooked because he chose me to be one of his 12 apostles. We have shared many triumphs and tragedies. I may not have been in the inner circle like Peter, but I have been a friend and companion to my Lord. What greater gift could life afford a fisherman? And now one of us is to betray him? It is unthinkable. Who could it be? How could he get away with it in his own heart? Could it be me, Andrew? Is it I? Is it I? I am James, the brother of John. I follow Jesus with my brother. After he called us while we were mending our nets by the Sea of Galilee. I was, in the home, I was with Jesus in the home of Jairus when he raised his little dog from the dead. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, we saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. <laughs> Last week we made this request to him. Teacher, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and the other at your left when you come into your kingdom. He replied, are you able to drink the cup? that I am to drink. We said, Lord, we are able. After that, Jesus put us in our place. He said, he who wants to be first must be servant of the law. And then he washed our feet. I can't tell you how humbling that was. He told us that God's way was always one of love. And now, he that called us love is about to be betrayed by someone that was supposed to love him. How could one of us do such a thing? I keep thinking deep down inside, in my own heart, Lord, is it I? Is it I? My name is Matthew. I was a tax collector based in Jerusalem. When Jesus came to, came to me and said, follow me, I had mixed emotions. I was a very important man. I knew in following Jesus, it meant I would give up everything I had worked for, my prestige, my wealth. Also, I knew it would change my life forever, but yet my heart longed for something that I know only He could fulfill. When Jesus said, all you come to me with heavy laden, I will give you rest. All the uncertainty, all the unrest were left my body. I knew then I'd have to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. But yet my heart was disturbed because He said, one of us? Would betray him? Is it to me? Jesus, is it I? My name is Philip. I come from Bethsaida in Galilee. While my friends and I were in Bethany listening to John the Baptist, Jesus called us to become his disciples. During all these years with Jesus, my faith has become stronger and deeper. I remember so well the poor when he fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish while asking him and others, where are we going to buy more bread for everyone? Little did I know that Andrew was already bringing a young boy and his lunch to Jesus. When Jesus was telling us that God was our Heavenly Father, it was almost beyond my understanding. But as I have continued to listen to the Master, I've grown to understand his words. In fact, I can almost say that he who has seen Jesus 
that see the Father. And now, after all that he's been through, he shocks us by telling us that there is a traitor in our midst. Does this traitor not know that betraying Jesus is betraying God? Could one of us be so blind? Who can it be? Could it be so? Is it I? Is it I? I am Thomas. Many think of me as a dad. But deep down, I'm really not. I guess I'm just the sort of person who likes to have truth before he believes. But that never stopped Jesus from loving me, showing me, and convincing me of who he is. I can still remember when Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus that his brother Lazarus had died. It hit us all pretty hard. And Jesus said, Let's go to him. We knew of the growing opposition to Jesus, and many of us really didn't want to go to Bethany. But I spoke up. I said, let us go with him, that we may also die with him. <clears throat> Why is it that everyone seems to remember our fears, but then forgets about our faith? I can almost see Jesus coming the winds on stormy Galilee, curing the sick, Healed the disease, opened the eyes of the blind. He unstopped the ears of the deaf. He cleansed the lepers. He preached the gospel to the poor. But who does that? Who goes out of the way for And now, why is it that Jesus' enemies are so bent on destroying him? Is it because he reveals a God that is greater? their petty man-made deities that they all serve? But what's this? He now says there is a traitor amongst the chosen. Is it me, Lord? Who could it be? Is it I? Is it I? <coughs> I'm John the Beloved. I was mending fishing nets with my father Zebedee and my brother James when Jesus came and asking me to follow him. And what a beautiful journey and love has been since that day. You see, Jesus, Jesus taught me that love is key. And it's God's love, God's amazing love, that compelled me to follow him. And since I've decided to follow Jesus, it's become very, very real to me that Jesus came from heaven to live and die for me so that we can be together forever. This offer is extended to everyone that decides to follow Jesus. So it saddens me when I hear that one of us will betray me. Is it I will? Is it I will? I am James, but it's such a familiar name. I know him as James the Lesson. I'll never forget the first time I saw the master. I was passing down the road by where John was baptized. I was curious, so I went in to have a closer look. Jesus asked John to baptize him. John refused, but Jesus insisted. After John baptized the Lord, the heavens opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of death. And we all heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, of whom I am well pleased. Since the Lord called me, I have followed him. And now one of us is to betray him? This is madness. <coughs> he surely betrayed him out of his mind. But the nagging feeling keeps coming back to me. Is it I? Is it I? I am Thaddeus. Jesus chose 12 of us to become the cornerstones of his new kingdom. Just as he chose the 12 tribes of Israel to be the cornerstones of the old Jewish kingdom. <coughs> After a night of prayer, the Lord gave us the authority over unclean spirits, and he also commissioned us to go into the world and to preach that the kingdom of heaven is now at hand. I was in Jerusalem with the master when he taught the crowds and said, Come unto me, ye that are heavy laden, and burn down, and I will give you rest. 
And now to think that the very one that came to carry our burdens and help us with our loads, that now he had this extra burden knowing that some one of his chosen was going to betray him. It was almost more than we could bear. Who could be this traitor? Who could uh, come against the Lord and, and betray him? It, it's, it's more than we can understand. Uh, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Or is it someone else? What else? My name is Nathaniel. And like many of the others, I am a fisherman. I was a disciple of John the Baptizer, but it was my friend Philip who came to me and said, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? The town of Nazareth is such a little, insignificant place that most have wondered why God would place his anointed in her midst. However, Philip simply replied, Come and see. When I saw Jesus, he said, Behold, an Israelite whom there is no God. How do you know me? I asked. He answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. How could he know? It seems that he has known me since the day I was born. How could I help but not believe? But how on earth am I supposed to believe something like this? I just find it so hard to believe that one of us would betray the anointed one of God. Could it be I? Is it I? I am Simon the Lord. Before Jesus called me, I belonged to a group of hot-headed, bloodthirsty revolutionaries called the Zoom. We was an armed rebellion against Rome and the reestablishment of King David's glorious kingdom of Israel. And then Jesus told us about another kind of kingdom, a kingdom of the human heart, where God reigns supreme. And since I've heard this, I have realized the only true and lasting conquest is the conquest of the heart. I have unconditionally and completely surrendered myself to him. But this surrender has not imprisoned me, but rather it has freed me for the very first time in my life. I'm not afraid of Rome anymore. She is mighty, but my God is almighty. Now the master says there's a spiritual Rome among us that is trying to take by force that only can be conquered by love. Who could it be? Could it be Matthew the public? Or the big fisherman or his brother? Or do he suspect me because I'm the only form of Zillah among us? Is it I alone? Is it I? Everyone else came from Galilee. My home is <coughs> taken care of in Judea. Hence, I have noticed Jesus is scary. The others must have trusted me because they trusted me as their treasure. Despite what others might have me believe, I believe Jesus trusted me, or he would not, he would not have he would never given me this position. Some say that it was Jesus who was talking about me when he said that he was talking about the, the love of money. And also when he said, Did I choose twelve of you for one of you to know? Sure, I got mad when Mary wasted that bottle of perfume on his feet. I still think it was wasted. If I conspired with the chief priest and buy 30 pieces of silver on me right now, that is my affair. I believe in Jesus, but he refuses to assert himself as Messiah. He refused to make a move. Glad well, made one. What would you do if you wanted to usher in his kingdom and assert himself as Messiah? He itched me that he knows what, I, that I, what I've done. He said so a couple of months ago when he was washing my feet. So should I just ignore what he says or should I piously and self-righteously ask myself, is it I? Is it I?
would betray me. Was he referring to me when he said that one of you will betray me? If I knew who the scoundrel was, I would pierce his heart or cut out his tongue with my bag. Could it be my own heart I pierce? God, grant that it would not be so. Yet, I keep wandering and saying to myself again and again, Lord, is it I? Is it I? You can hear the fear and hurt in the, of the disciples as they question in their minds how it could be one of them. You can imagine the dread in Judas when he realized it was him and the hurt of the other disciples when their friend is revealed as the traitor. I can't even think of what Jesus was feeling at this moment. Sorrow, betrayal, rejection, pain, loneliness. Here is a room full of his closest companions, men he has shared his earthly life with, and many of these men would suffer a martyr's death. John. John was in exile on the Isle of Patmos after escaping without entry from a pot of boiling oil. He was later returned and was the only disciple to die at a great age. Peter. Along with many of the other saints, Nero sought to have put to death. Jerome tells us that he was crucified, his head being down and his feet upward as he himself requested. He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as our Lord. And his wife also suffered martyrdom. Andrew. Andrew was crucified at Odessa on a cross shaped like the letter X with two ends put deep into the ground. This was to become the St. Andrew's cross. James the Elder. He was put to death by Herod Agrippa. As James was led away to the place of martyrdom, his accuser was brought to report of his conduct. And it was reported that his accuser then fell on his knees and confessed that he was a Christian, resolving that James should not receive the crown of martyrdom alone. Philip. Philip suffered martyrdom at Parga. He was scourged thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified. Nathaniel. Nathaniel was cruelly beaten and crucified upside down. Thomas. Thomas excited the rage of the pagan priest while he was preaching, and he was martyred being thrust through with a spear. Matthew. Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia, being slain with a long handled axe. James the Less. He was beaten, stoned, and had his head crushed with a fuller's club, a tool that was used for spreading iron. Thaddeus. Thaddeus was crucified at Odessa and Simon. Simon was crucified at Judea. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God.
He laid down His life a ransom for many. The perfect Lamb of God who knew no sin yet took upon Himself all the sin of mankind who would ever be born. What man could never do, Christ accomplished on the cross that we might be redeemed. Oh, the price that was paid for our salvation that we might believe and be saved. We in this room will most likely never have to pay the price that many of the disciples had to pay, but ultimately they were willing to pay that price for the cause of Christ because they believed. And they believed because they were witness to Jesus' life, love, and ultimate sacrifice for their sins and ours. Later that same night, after he had eaten his final supper with his disciples, Jesus was betrayed by one of his closest companions. He was rejected, abused, and imprisoned. The next morning, he was handed over to Pontius Pilate. And even in that court, with Pilate desperately trying to find a way out of it, Jesus was wrongfully convicted. Pilate even washed his hands to symbolically absolve himself from responsibility. But the people had spoken, and he handed Jesus over to be crucified. It was then that Jesus was brutally beaten, bearing the stripes and wounds in his body that would pay for our transgressions and sinfulness and provide healing for our bodies and souls. After the beating, he was mocked as king, had a crown of thorns placed on his head. The thorns stuck deep into the brow. And after placing a robe over his bleeding body, he began a long journey of carrying the cross. The beating from the soldiers continued, and yet he still made his way toward a redeeming act that would change the course of mankind forever, all the way to Golgotha, the place of death, where they drove nails into his hands and feet. On that cross, for my sin, for your sin, for the sins of the world. Then they stood him on a cross between two thieves, a criminal's punishment for the only sinless, blameless man who had ever lived. As his strength began to fail, and it was taking all he had within him to breathe, Jesus took what would be his final breath, cried out and said, It is finished. The king, our Savior, died that day, and in his death the sin debt was paid once and for all. The earth trembled in response to the events of that day. And then the separation between God and man was removed. It was a dark day when the Son of God died on that cross. And the last act of Jesus as a man on this earth was to be placed in a marble tomb. This is the price that Jesus paid for you and for me. His willingness to go to the cross and to die a sinner's death that our sins might be forgiven. This opportunity, this very same opportunity, exists for you and I tonight. You have an opportunity here tonight, if you've not ever done it before, to give your life to the Christ who died for you. Who gave his life freely and willingly on that cross in obedience to his Father's direction. So what I'd like for us to do for the next few moments, if you would, is just to bow your heads. And I'm going to ask, with our heads bowed and people pray, if you would like to receive Christ as your Savior tonight, Ask Him to forgive you of your sin. To set your life back on the course that He has for you. This is what I just want you to do. Is just please, where you're seated, just lift your hand. And by doing that, by lifting your hand, you're simply saying, Pastor, when you pray, please pray for me. I need to give my life to Jesus tonight. I need to ask Him to forgive me. Come into my life. Take away my sin. I say, with heads bowed and no one looking around. You've been brought into this place tonight and I feel that tug upon your heart. 
you just slip your hand up right where you are and we'll include you in this prayer of salvation. Thank you. 
Friday night is not the 